Welcome to the Relaunch Your Career podcast. I'm your host, Leah Lambert, career and interview coach and founder of Relaunch Me, where we help you find the work that you were meant to do. Today, I am talking to Tina Patterson. Tina is a, a friend of mine and she has 20 years experience working for global businesses across nine industries and 12 countries. She's led big delivery teams across transformation, project management, lean, Six Sigma, agile, change, human-centered design, PMO governance, collaboration, finance, and operations. Tina has recently gone out on her own. Um, she now has her own business, Tina Patterson Consulting, and she's working with corporates to help them work smarter. Welcome to the podcast, Tina. Thanks, Leah. Thank you so much for having me today. Well, Tina, I always like to start these interviews at the beginning. Are you able to share with us what your career journey has been and where where you've started all those years ago? Yes, sure. Uh, I've had a really varied career. uh, And so I would say I'm more of a generalist than a specialist. And there have been a couple of pivotal roles that I've had and things that I've learned along the way that I'd love to share with you and your followers. So I actually started in HR, in human resources. And this was back in 1999. And uh, I joined HR because I, I knew that I loved people. I loved helping people. And so that's why I went into to it. But I found out pretty quickly that HR back in 1999 was a bit more focused on the process side of things and it wasn't what I was looking for. And uh, I was in a meeting, I was lucky enough to be in a meeting with the CEO. I, I was at um, General Electric back then and I was on a graduate program and he, uh, his, and he spoke about his definition of leadership. And I actually disagreed with him. And I remember the look of horror on all the other graduates' faces of the fact that he was I, this 23-year-old fresh out of university who was disagreeing with the CEO. And out of that conversation, though, um, he actually asked me to go and work for him because he was actually really impressed that I had the courage to say what I thought. And that was my first learning that I've carried throughout my career of if you believe in something enough, feel have the courage to speak up. And so working with David was amazing. And um, through that time, and I was working on business strategy, he gave me some great advice. And that was that in your career, when you rise to senior levels, you have to know finance. It doesn't matter if you're the chief information officer, the chief people officer, marketing. If you don't understand the business you're in and how it makes money to be able to be um, grow and be sustainable, you really don't have a proper seat at the table. So based on David's advice, I went to the States and um, ended up for five, staying there for five years in internal audit and finance manager roles. And then from there, decided it was time to come back to Australia and I went into customer facing roles. So I led a department of quite a few hundred people um, in, with the contact centres and that was a great place where I really learned the importance of putting myself in the customer's shoes because I was listening to the customer calls every day. So I really always encourage people also, aside from learning finance, to work out how you can get close to the customer and understand who your customers are and what they care about. And when I was in that role, I also had um, knew that I wanted to improve so many things in the contact centre. And so I had an area of continuous improvement under me. And that's when I really got into um, having uh, a project management area as well as uh, Lean and Six Sigma. So continuously improving the processes that we had. And from there, I got certified as a master black belt in Lean and Six Sigma. Uh, And from there, then ended up um, taking a career break for a little bit to have my kids and then came back into transformation. And so, uh, and then changing companies also with transformation and ended up as the director of projects at Bupa where um, I had um, areas such as change management, the business project managers under me, as well as the different methodologies and governance, so the ways of working and project finance. So there's some of um, the roles that I've had and some of the key lessons I've learned along the way that has um, got me to where I was from a corporate standpoint. And now, I, as you mentioned, I've gone out on my own now and I'm 
um, and helping other organisations uh, in, in terms of how they work smarter using a lot of their different methodologies and transformation experience that I have. So, you know, I love that um, the story that, you know, and the fact that you were given that advice to go into the finance area. And, and I can't even imagine you really working in internal audit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, what fantastic advice. And, you know, there's so many, um, you know, positions that do require that financial acumen and the budgetary management that if you don't have those skills, it definitely puts you behind particularly in transformation and project management, I've been surprised at how much I have used my finance skills going back 15 years ago. So if you think about running a project, usually you have a budget. And so to understand the financial sides of the costs, as well as then the benefits when there are financial benefits and to be able to do that modelling, it's a wonderful skill um, to have. So I I know that when I have um, had project managers who have been working with me who have had that financial acumen, often that is something that has set them apart. Yeah, interesting. Now, you you mentioned before about becoming a qualified black belt and uh, Six Sigma, and I remember at the time um, when you were going through that and really having no idea what you were actually doing. Um, But we don't hear about Six Sigma as much anymore. It's more around agile and waterfall and other project management methodologies. Can you give us some insight into how those have changed over the years since you've been working in these areas and what the sort of hot trends are right now? Yeah, sure. So uh, all of these different methodologies, for those of you listening, thinking, I'm not really sure what you're talking about. They're all just different ways that you can approach a customer problem uh, to be able to fix it. That's in a real super simple terms, the way I look at it. Uh, And so there are ones such as Six Sigma uh, that started going back, uh, companies such as Toyota, General Electric are known for these and about really fixing processes by understanding where their defects are. Um, Lean is a great one looking at where there's waste in a process. So where have you got um, steps that don't add any value and you want to take them out. Um, waterfall is uh, one of the key project management uh, methodologies where you're quite, you go through quite a structured step to think through in terms of what your high level design is into detailed design, et cetera. Um, you mentioned hot areas. I think Agile and another one called Human Centered Design also gets mm. called HCD. They're the two that I've seen that are definitely these days a lot more popular uh, than uh, Waterfall, Lean and Six Sigma. And these Great. really um, focus, the human centre design focuses on really putting yourself in the customer's shoes and um, to be able to work with them so you don't assume what they want, but you really work with them to understand uh, what their needs are. In my mind, it's great to, to have human centre design skills, no matter which methodology or projects that you use. It is a wonderful um, skill set to have. In terms of Agile, usually that's around having teams that focus, um, they they stay together. So get called fixed capacity teams that work together in sprints to be able to um, build things quite quickly, ship them out to their customers and then to pivot or to um, fix them as such and make them better uh, when they need. And so Agile definitely in the market right now is one that a lot of companies have gone from either Waterfall, Lean Six Sigma and shifting to more agile ways of working. So I would say that that one is definitely where I see it's a a lot um, of a hotter skill set right now. Just a questioner regarding agile. Um, I work with a lot of clients who are very keen to get into these areas and often they are ready to go and enrol in agile courses which are quite expensive as you would know what is your opinion from someone who has actually hired people and recruited in this area will someone have an opportunity to get into this area by doing a course or do they need specific experience skills and attributes um, that are perhaps gained internally well what's your view on that Uh, This is a great question, Leah, and it's one that I wish I could share my answer more uh, 
because I, I think there are a lot of people who think that they can just go and do a course and then because they have the title or they've done scrum master training for example that any company is going to hire them off um, you know straight off the bat and um, put them into that role speaking from my own experience I always have preferred to go for someone who has the practical experience in agile over someone who has a course so if I had two candidates one has um, the course but no practical experience and the other has worked in agile teams and had um, you know quite a bit of time actually working in an agile environment and but didn't have a qualification most of those times I'd actually choose the person who had the practical experience because I think agile is wonderful and it's something that can set when you read the books and you read the theory it can be quite straightforward yet when you get into reality of actually um, building out a minimal viable product or MVP as it gets called um it, it actually, there's a lot of nuances in the methodology. So nothing beats the practical experience in my books. So for those of you listening who go, I'm going to do a course and go straight in, I would suggest you, um, courses are great, but think about how you can get the practical experience. So that comes to my next question. Yes. <laughs> how, how would one get that practical experience? Would they need to have a particular undergraduate qualification to how, where would they uh, start in terms of getting their yeah. foot in the door? What sort of roles would they look for and what sort of skills would they need? Great question. I, I'd actually look more to the company themselves. So if you, if you are wanting to um, get into an agile role, have a look for the companies that they have agile ways of working. And there are loads of customers who've been very, very public about their move to agile ways of working. So two super big ones that are that have been very public about it, being Telstra and ANZ. They're companies that throughout the organisation, they want people to um, follow those ways of working. So even if you um, go into a company in a role that might not be a scrum master role or whichever one you choose, um, then to work through how can you actually get into one of those teams um, to be able to, um, you know, get that practical experience. And so I've absolutely had people contact me in the past who have had a, a completely different role but have said, I really want to understand, be it Agile or one of the other uh, project methodologies, um, and I love that initiative when someone comes and says, hey, here's what I'm interested in doing. Is there a project or is it possible to join one of these teams? Um, it's a great way to be able to get in. And if you do that, a, a good way also to be able to do that is to think through upfront, what can you do to help them? So it could be that you are from a marketing background, say, and you have great insight around um, the customers. And so to be able to share that with that team so that they get something first before then they take you on to be able to um, help with your own learning. So um, initiative in my mind goes a long way. And Tina, so in those agile teams, would they, would they be made up of people from a whole range of different business functions? Often they are. It depends upon what exactly it is that they're focused on, but often, yes, they are. Okay, great. And just going back to transformation, um, we hear a lot about transformation, but I think for a lot of us, we don't really know what goes on behind the scenes. Are you able to give us some examples of the types of projects that someone might work on if they're working in this area? Yes, so um, transformation, probably similar to Agile actually, it's definitely another one of those hot areas right now. So, but to your point, a lot of people don't really understand when someone says transformation, well, what does that mean? So the analogy I'm sure many of you hear about is where you've got the caterpillar that turns into a butterfly. That caterpillar has transformed. And so transformation is not about small incremental changes. It's about fundamentally overhauling. It could be um, a process. It could be a system. It could be ways of working or how 
um, a department is structured. And so completely doing it in a different way to be able to get an absolute step change in performance. So that's what um, it looks like. So if you think about, and as I said, so I always think about the the people, the process and the technology. Um, Mm. And so it could be around completely either centralising or decentralising a department and how they work. It could be completely digitising a process that has old hand hand based forms. There are all different types of um, things, and often they come under a transformation program. So you have lots of parts that make up the whole. Right, and so that that is a very um, great definition, and I like um, you know it's very straightforward and easy for us to understand. Can you explain how change management differs from transformation or is it transformation just a fancy name for change management? Uh, so, uh, and so change management is a, um, a skill set as such that uh, gets used within transformation as well as in other types. So where we were talking about agile before, often you'll have change managers or change analysts associate, uh, or as part of agile teams. Same with Waterfall, Six Sigma, Lean, etc. Often there are change management professionals, their specific roles within a, a project as well. So um, change management, in my mind, is a way of making sure that the transformation sticks. And I think one of the things that I, I've learned in my career, um, so irrespective of which methodology you choose, mainly you're wanting to make something better if you boil it down into super simple terms. Mm -hmm. But often people focus on the delivery. And so, for example, it's we are launching this new system on pick a date on the 27th of September and people focus on that date of when they're looking to launch. But that's not actually the important thing. What's important is that six months down the track, the team who engages with that system or the customers who do, are they using it? Have they embraced it and adopted it? And so when I think about change management, I think about they embed the changes with all, be it the the employees or the customers, so that when that project team disbands or the agile team kind of pulls out, those ways of working have absolutely embraced whatever the change was that was implemented so that it is sustainable and lives on after the people who put it in have left. Okay, that makes better sense. So the change manager is a part of the transformation process. Yes. Okay, so what advice would you have for someone? If, if someone was interested in working in transformation, what sort of background and skills would they need to potentially move into this type of area? Yeah, so I think the key skills that um, I look always look at in this area is um, stakeholder management and with that change management as well is a really big part because transformation is really hard um, because often you're wanting people to do things differently than they have. And as we all know, often people like comfort and the status quo. So um, it takes someone who can really connect with people and understand what their views are to be able to help them transform the be it the people processes or technology to something else. So stakeholder management and the people skills is one. And along the same lines, customer focus, putting yourself in be it your customer shoes or employee shoes is really important as well so that whatever you're coming up with of um, the future state that you're transforming to, that it um, it makes sense and it's done in a way that they're going to embrace. I think organisational skills definitely help. So um, being organised is another great skill. I mentioned the finance skills across all all roles but also there and I think finally resilience as I said transformation is hard um, and often transformation programs do last a couple of years so having that resilience to keep going and because you know that there's a better way even if the change to get there is hard it's a really great skill to have so they're the sorts of things that I um, that I look for uh, in the people who I've hired in the transformation space previously. So I would imagine, I mean, it sounds like influencing skills wouldn't go astray either. Oh, absolutely. That's to me in with the stakeholder management. I absolutely would agree influencing skills in there is incredibly important. 
So would you say that someone to be selected for a role in that area that you would need to have a fairly strong personal brand in the organisation in order to be able to influence those stakeholders? It definitely helps, yes. Mm. Okay, great. Now, Tina, you recently made a very big decision to leave uh, a very successful career at Bupa to go out and do your own thing as Tina Patterson Consulting. Are you able to explain to the listeners what decision-making process that you went through in order to make the final decision? Yeah, sure. So I love corporate life. So uh, it was a really hard decision to make. Um, I loved working at Booper. I'd been there for nearly six years. And before that, I'd been at General Electric, um, both in Australia and lots of different countries um, and worked there for nearly 16 years. So for me, as much as I loved working at uh, both of these organisations, I, I wanted more breadth. So I wanted to be able to take all my experience and actually to work across a lot of different companies and to help a lot more. So um, my real, real passion is about helping people and organisations to work smarter. So that's through, if you think about transformation and Lean Six Sigma Agile, it's all about improving stuff. And so for me, it's taking um, what I've loved working at GE and Bupa and just helping so many more organisations and people uh, in these same areas. So I know that, you know, particularly since COVID's happened, you're doing a lot of work with corporates to help people work smarter at home. Do you have a couple of tips that you could pass on to us for those who are struggling a little bit, working from home, perhaps homeschooling as well, uh, <laughs> yep. in order to help us be a little bit more productive? Yeah, absolutely. And I think working from home, I, before I get into what the uh, tips are, I think there are people who absolutely love working from home and I'm in that category. Uh, and then there are people that it's actually pretty tough right now to do that. Um, the, the one thing I would say is when we're through this time, I really do hope that um, organisations um, offer up working from home if they, they didn't previously for their people. Uh, I'm a really, really big believer in focusing on outcomes over hours in the office. So it shouldn't matter where you work or when you work, as long as you collaborate effectively and you get your work done, if it's in the office or at home, shouldn't really matter that much. So I'm, I'm really hoping that organisations can see also that you can be so productive working from home when you don't have commute time, uh, et cetera. So I just encourage listeners to think about that of when we're through this of is working from home, be it one day a week, something that you might want to consider on an ongoing basis because you really can work a lot smarter, I believe, when you do mix things up. That said, uh, a couple of tips for right now that I have. One of the big ones that I have, and it's not this one's not for right now, but when, when you work from home uh, at any time is being really, really clear what your goals are for the day and what is the order of priority. And I love the word priority and it, it's been in the English language for centuries. But if you go way, way back when it came in, the word priority was singular. So people would talk about my priority is, and I, I've heard people talk in businesses, my top 20 priorities are, and there's a saying I love that if everything is important, then nothing is. So getting really, really clear on what is your priority, so your next most important thing to work on is a really good thing to do. I think the other thing about working from home, and this is specifically right now where um, work and home, those lines are completely blurred for people. So where it used to be where you might work from home for, say, one day a week, and then you'd be back in the office. So it was quite cut and dried of where was your work and where was your home. And right now we don't have that. So I think it's really important to build in a routine that can um, tell your brain when it's work time and when it's home time. And so, and this is also, you mentioned for kids who are home as well and doing remote learning of school, it applies just as much to them as it does uh, for people who are working. And it's about thinking through what is your commute, be it to home or school, even if it might be to the next room. So for example, and my kids 
don't like it that much, but I do make them do it. Of Before they start school, and it's the same for me starting work, they go outside, walk around the side of the house and then go in the back door. And that is then they are arriving at school and then um, I'm arriving at work, even though it's still in our home. And then at the end of the day, when it's time to finish, for me, the sign is I shut my laptop And just hearing that click tells me it's time now to recharge because I think to work smarter, it's about focusing on when you're working, you're working. It's productive time. But then also you need time for your body and your mind to recharge. So creating that delineation is really, really important. And the final uh, tip that I would give is about thinking about what your non-negotiables are. And I got this term from an amazing person called Dr. Bill Mitchell, um, if you're interested in finding out more about non-negotiables. But this is about thinking about the things outside of work that give you energy. So, for example, for me, um, it's about running three times a week and doing yoga. And those four sessions through the week, when I do them, I have a lot more energy to do my work. And so thinking through what whatever your own non-negotiables are, they could be walking your dog, it could be playing with your kids, um, whatever it is, but then also being specific about when are you going to do them. So for me, my runs are Wednesday, Friday, Sunday morning. My yoga is 6.30 Monday nights. And I have that time. I've got kids. So with my husband, that's guilt-free time where he knows he's with the kids. He has, um, you know, similar amount of time. That is his guilt-free, go for a walk, listen to a podcast um, and that really helps them to have the energy so that when you're working you are working and productive I love that tip and I know we've talked about this before and I think isn't isn't the saying you use it or you lose it if you don't use your time yep absolutely (laughs) and and it's a it's amazing how simple that is because I think if you just leave it as I'm going to run three times a week. What often, well, I used to have that and it would get to Saturday and I'd go, okay, so I've got three runs to do. I can do two today and one tomorrow, (laughs) you know, and that doesn't really work. (laughs) So having the use it or lose it, that kind of scarcity um, definitely helps to motivate sometimes to go, okay, I'll put my running shoes on. And once I get going, obviously, um, fine. Often it's just getting the shoes on and out the door in the first place. That's the hardest part. I think that's great advice. And look, I, I, as you know, we share a mutual love of running and I, I yep. think it's the only thing that's keeping me sane at the moment, Going, getting out and going for a run every day. But my problem is when things go back to normal and I'm running kids around all week, that's when things start to slip. So I think I definitely need to uh, implement those non-negotiables in my calendar going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And literally book them in as though it's a meeting with your boss or a meeting with a client, you know, put them in. And um, there's absolutely been research done of when you name when and where you're going to do something, you're so much more likely to do it than if you just say, oh, yep, I'll go for a run at some stage tomorrow. It's going to be at seven o'clock and here's where I'm going to run. Um, You're much more likely to do it then. So, Tina, tell us uh, one last question. What's next for Tina Patterson? (laughs) And if someone was interested in working with you or engaging you as a speaker, how can they find you? Yeah, sure. So what's next? One of the things that... um has come out of this situation that we find ourselves in is that I'm doing a lot of work speaking with um, with corporates and other organisations about um, how to be effective when working from home, as well as I, I have another um, module that talks about for working parents of how do you actually get work done while also having often either kids right next to you if they're really young or um, remote learning. So that's the what I'm doing now, which I absolutely love. So uh, if anyone is interested in getting in touch um, in any way, LinkedIn is definitely the best way to do it. It's Tina Patterson with one T. So P-A-T-E-R-S-O-N. So feel free to drop me a note, connect. Um, and I also share a lot of um, videos and advice just on how to work smarter uh, that I'd love to share with you. And I will put those details in the show notes as well. Well, Tina, thank you so much. You've given us um, so much great advice and really great insights into your career and the different areas. So I really appreciate you coming on the show and look forward to hopefully having a chat with you 
in the near future about um, what Tina Patterson Consulting, where the direction that you take your new business. Thanks so much for having me today, Leah. Thanks, Tina. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Relaunch Your Career. If you did, please subscribe, share with your friends, leave a review or connect with us on social media at Relaunch Me Career Consulting. If you have any questions about the episode or the work that we do, then contact us via the website relaunchme.com.au. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.